um, just, uh, yeah, first thing I'd like to do is uh, carry on defence of my colleagues in the Kelly Business School. No, it's not the economic department. That's right, yeah. Donald Patrick and Owen Reed, for example, have written on privatisation, etc. So they can be classed with the, uh, the neoliberals in that same sense. Um, I'm picking up really where Kieran's fourth point, which was about wages and uh, the cut in wages and the drive to reduce wages, particularly in the uh, among low skilled workers, among low pay workers, and indeed it's in the area we call the uh, these workers are covered by uh, a series of committees called the joint labour committees which you may have heard about and the joint labour committees um, exist for a number of areas uh, such as contact cleaning security workers holiday uh, hotel workers uh, to name but a few and there's about 30, as far as I'm aware. I'm not the expert, by the way, in joint labour committees. Uh, Michelle is, and she's not here, obviously. But there's about 30 uh, joint labour committees. And uh, they were originally trades boards. And, of course, they cover people who, as I said before, are on low pay and um, generally are not unionised. And... Uh, well, with the minimum wage, around the minimum wage. But, in fact, the, these, these uh, joint labour committees, just to, to give you just a notion of structure, they, are, they have representatives from the trade unions and from the employers, and there's an independent chairperson. And they set the rate of pay for these particular groups. Um, they've operated since 1946, and they also include they set not just pay rates, but weight, uh, working conditions as well. They might have, to, uh, as probably has become popular or uh, well known, they would set some like, premium rates, overtime rates, and um, uh, holidays and uh, uh, conditions like that. So, the numbers of employees covered by the JLCs has increased substantially, as you can see from this, since 1926. And they rose up to around 160,000 to 170,000. Now, I, I talked about the estimate of the number of people covered by joint labour committees. Now, as we go on to see uh, at the very end, I, I indicate there's a sort of new strategy emerging by the trade unions to try and uh, cover these kinds of workers. But in the main, they, uh, they have been a large growth in these particular employees. One of the things about these people who are covered by joint labour committees is many of them are not even aware they're covered by joint labour committees. They're not in a trade union. Most of the, the I would say the bulk of these workers who are in trade unions are probably in the retail, wholesale sector. Probably some of them are covered by a mandate and uh, they will be aware that they are JLC workers. So, okay. They have been challenged in recent times, but to go back to the original, uh, I should have mentioned this, of course, they were set up, by the way, basically through, uh, in, in when I was uh, part of the UK, and it was set up in the early part of the 20th century. And one of the prime movers to set them up, ironically, was Winston Churchill, who was a member of the Liberal Party at the time, and who along during his more radical uh, period with Lloyd George. Uh, he was instrumental in setting up the trades boards. And at that particular time, it was seen as a need to protect these vulnerable workers. They were seen as sweatshops. And what, at that particular period, the rationale was that if uh, there was no control, if there was no regulation of the rates of pay and conditions, that workers would be, the employers would drive down the wages and you would have uh, wages dropping to below subsistence level. It would drive out good employers, it would drive out good investment, and it would bring in, of course, a race to the bottom. And that was the rationale at the time, and that remains essentially the same rationale it's still there, as we see. But, so, that was the initial uh, 
uh, rationale and as I say has remained. And so the Joint Labour Committees developed over a period of time from 1946 became much more extensive as we've seen from the numbers and much more important then to locate people in, in, in the labour market. Now there was a constitution challenge in 2008 uh, and um, so as you can see, uh, this is not my, slightly my area of expertise, but anyway, uh, there was uh, a lot of breaches of the employment regulation orders. The employment regulation order is the particular uh, Method, mechanism by which rates are set, and it is a legal uh, order which is set by the Joint Labour Committee. Now, some of the reasons why it was challenged are the, the employers, of course, wanted to rearrange the rates, they wanted to initially essentially they want to get rid of the JLCs, but in particular they claimed that things like overtime rates were excessively expensive and were reducing the levels of employment in the area. Now the real basis of this paper, this presentation, is about the fundamental challenge there that came from the, uh, the economic crisis and in particular the argument that JLC pay rates were costing jobs and, I suppose, to the employer's delight, the IMF, the EU, packaged the Memorandum of Understanding, laid out that there was to be a review of the Joint Labour Committees with a view to reforming these committees, and in particular, obviously, with a view to adjusting the rates of pay, rationalising the area, and addressing the high cost of things like Sunday premiums. So this was the fundamental uh, challenge that arose. So in that sense, this comes into Kieran's fourth point. This was one of the mechanisms used to adjust the cost of labor, particularly, ironically, at the lower end first. They didn't address the higher ends, as you may have noticed. Uh, hospital consultants are still going around with their lives salaries and there's no attack there as to any real extent. So the biggest attack that has occurred is at the lower end through the JLC system which was there to protect this, uh, the lowest that is paid in the, the labour market. Okay so this is an area which had lots of arguments from the employers and of course the trade unions defending the JLCs being necessary uh, but had little evidence. There was actually very little evidence. Very, we, we know little about how many people are covered, and we, we don't have a particular grasp of exactly how much people are paid in these areas, what the rates of overtime are, etc. And so it was our intention to try and examine this particular area look at the overtime earnings, the shift allowances, the bonuses, compare them with people who weren't in within the JLC's kind of rates. Now the reason we were able to do this is that we now have a database provided by CSO, uh, and I'll come back to that, but first of all, that's the particular purpose of the presentation in the paper, is to look at this particular Area using whatever evidence we can find. The theoretical approach is, and we begin with the basic mainstream economic understanding of this area, which is that it's very simple. If you reduce the cost of labour, you will increase the numbers who are employed. It's as simple as that. And that, therefore, any particular artificial setting of the wage rate is going to reduce the numbers of employed. So people would suffer, workers would suffer, there'd be less jobs for them. Now what we find when we look at, and it's a very disputed area, it's not just uh, the preserve of 
neoliberal economists, but there's a lot of controversy in the area, particularly around minimum wages. So really we're talking about the debate around minimum wages. Do minimum wages reduce employment or do they enhance employment? And some people claim lots of research has been done. There's a huge amount of research out there. And in fact, the answer is it might and it might not. It's not clear what the answer is. But from whatever evidence we do have, and some research has been undertaken, even by some people in the SRI, on the impact of the national minimum wage rate introduced in Ireland in 2002. And what they found was very little or no impact. So basically, we find that there are many studies which show little impact from uh, minimum wages. Now, what we also find are that there are many employers willing to pay above the minimum rate. And in fact, in this paper, we use the economic arguments which economists themselves have, have developed, which is around the area we call efficiency wages. And efficiency wages is a very simple idea, really, is that if you pay more to people, they're going to work better. It's very simple. So if you drive people down, drive wages down, at a certain point, you're going to actually get less output. You're going to get less effective uh, work. You're going to get poorer quality work. And in the end, it may be, in fact, uneconomic. It, you may, in fact, be losing out. So there's a reason why employers will, in fact, not always drive wages down to the lowest level. Not all employers, anyway. They may feel, they do, evidence shows that many employers prefer to pay above the rate because they get better quality employees and their reputation is improved. And for a number, of, and again, labor costs don't always make up a huge proportion of total costs. So in that sort of situation then, for employers, it may be more effective to pay above rates to provide reasonable working conditions because they get more efficient, more motivated, uh, better quality workers. So, if employers do drive down the wages, the argument is, from the efficiency wage perspective, is that they, in fact, become trapped in a poor quality work system. It also drives out good investment. Now, I'll give you an example. There is an example of where efficiency wages were used to a great extent. And I'll come back to that. But we do have the example. In Sweden in the 1960s, they moved towards a solidaristic wage policy, which is that you bring everybody's wage in towards the same level. And in fact, it was estimated that in Sweden in the late 60s, in the blue collar worker area, I don't have anything on the white collar, from the blue collar worker area, there's a lot of blue collar workers in the 60s. Uh, the difference between the lowest paid blue collar worker in Sweden and the highest paid was 30%. So if you got a 30% rise, you were then at the top, from the bottom to the top of the wage distribution. Why does that develop? The solidaristic wage policy, which was, of course, promoted by the trade unions and the Social Democratic Party, uh, it had an economic efficiency purpose. The idea was that if you for the, the low paid, for those employers who paid very, paid their workers very little, of course, they were disadvantaged. Because with a solidaristic wage policy, they were made to pay wages towards the center. It advantaged the employers who paid, who would have had to pay higher wages, because they could pay lower wages because of this solidaristic wage policy. So it advantaged the high pay, the, the, the high skill, the, uh, productive and effective employers who are making profits and a disadvantage to the, the, the employers who were ineffective and who couldn't actually pay the rates of pay that were being set. So what happened was that the employers at the lower end went out of business. That was the whole idea, was to drive them out of business because they were seen as unproductive, inefficient, and that reward the good employers and therefore these 
uh, good employers invested because they made more profits. The idea was that you created a system where you actually encourage economic development through this kind of solidaristic wage policy. Now, just to decide, a similar process, by the way, occurred in the national wage process in Ireland during the 1990s and into the early 2000s. And in fact, the sector most advantaged by the national wage agreements was the multinational sector in Ireland. Because they didn't have to pay, they had high productivity, and they didn't have to pay high wages because the wages were set by the national uh, wage agreement. So instead of paying, on average, if you looked at the wage agreements, perhaps it was 2-3% per year, at a time when productivity was hitting 8-9% per year. So multinationals gained substantially during that period and were very advantaged by the national wage agreements. So that's kind of a solidaristic wage policy in a sense. So a similar argument, anyway, a similar argument pertains to the efficiency wage policies that in a sense, the idea is to reward good employers, efficient, effective employers, and to disadvantage the, the less efficient employers, who, because they're inefficient, have to pay very low wages in order to keep going to make profits. Now, the basis on which we looked at the Joint Labour Committee of the People in this area was we used a National Employment Survey, 2007 National Employment Survey. And this is a, an employer-employee match survey. The employer fills in a form, and there's a random sample of employees within each firm. It's a substantial survey, the biggest we have in that sense, uh, that's located at firm level. And uh, there was about 60,000, 65,000 uh, respondents in the survey. But 40,000 were from the private sector. We're only going to look at the private sector, so we've taken out the public sector. Uh, in, in the particular, so there's two, two uh, this survey says a match survey, and the <coughs> employer fills in all the economic data for the, the employees who've been chosen to fill in the survey in, within the firm. So if a firm has 100 employees, CSO samples 10 employees, these 10 employees then, the records for these 10 employees, the, the, the financial data is filled in by the employer. So it's quite a well matched. The kind of data that the employer fills in are the earnings per hour, the overtime hours, the bonuses, whether they work shift, the hours they work, there are a lot of other factors. So it's a, it's a very comprehensive match database. And it's grossed up in 2007, there's 1.7 million employees. So the real question there is how many employees are low paid? And in fact, we end up estimating a range. Nobody, ha we can't actually get, our, get a complete uh, fix on this. But what we can do is, we look, we took, there's about 14 JLCs, we took the rates of pay in 14 JLCs. We constructed a range. So uh, do I have the range there? 8.23 to 9.68 was the range we chose because that reflects the rates of pay in the JLCs. We then used this rate to s separate out the respondents who were on this particular rate of pay. And that, as I have a table there, okay. Now this table is interesting, because if you look at it, the centre one is the constructed range. So everybody on that range, all the, the respondents in the private sector, from 8.23 to 9.68, you can see there's 168,000 covered by this particular range. Now you can also see, by the way, that there's people below that range. Now the national minimum wage is eight at the time October 2007 was 8.65 euros per hour. And you can see that there are 22,000 people responded on less than that. Don't ask me. This is filled in by the employer. The employer wouldn't fill in the rate that was incorrect. How they can be below 8.65, I don't know. 
these are excluded because they don't even fall within the JLC range. They're below the national minimum wage. I have no idea. So, and you can then you see the proportion of people that are on the next grade, by the way, 9.69 to 10.86. And the, the, the reason why I have 10.86 there, 10.86 represents two thirds of the medium wage, which is the rate of low pay. So when we're looking at the rate of low pay, we look at two thirds of the average mean earnings per hour, and that's 10.68 is that here. So anybody below 10.68 is a low pay, is class low pay worker. And you can see that 25% of the private sector, it's all totaled up, 25% of the private sector are actually on low pay, which is quite substantial. So this is the, anyway, the, the group we were really interested in is these people within the JLC range. And what we wanted to find out was how much overtime are they working? Are they of real cost to the employer? Just how much extra are they getting? Uh, because that's the employer's arguments for the reform of the JLCs and the, the assumption within the IMF and the EU deal was that these were a very costly group of people and somehow they were getting high Sunday so premiums, getting lots of overtime, they were very costly to the employer. Now, I won't go into who they are. They're typically, you can imagine, they're mainly female, less educated, part-time, under 25 years of age, the type of things we would typically we would expect that they would be. Non-Irish are twice as likely, for example, to be in the JLC range. They're usually manual type workers, they're non-unionized. Again, we're not sufficiently surprised at that. And they mainly work in the hotels, restaurants and hotel retail, uh, retail sectors, which again, we would expect all these things. So there's nothing unusual there. Now what we do find is, when we look at the actual rates, we come up with some surprising uh, results. And here we have the hours worked per week. And not, so what I've done is to split it between the people on the JLC range who are covered by, typically covered by joint labor committees, and people above the JLC range, that is everybody else. I've taken out those people below 8.23, these are the people who are even below the national minimum wage rate, I don't know who they are, be interesting to look at them on their own, but they're out. And what we see here is, first of all, uh, as we'd expect, those people above the JLC range work more hours. They work 36 hours a week. Those on the JLC range work 30 hours a week. Now, that's, this is important for some of the stuff later. They don't, in other words, on average, work long hours. They work short hours. The number of overtime hours per week, and it's worth looking at this figure. Average for the 168,000 JLC covered workers is a half an hour overtime per week. One half an hour. That's the average, and so we're averaging it over everybody. The average above the range is 1.1 hours, which is very, again very small. So overtime hours, on average, and this, this, remember these are averages, quite small. The overtime hours as a percentage of hours worked weekly in the JLC range, 1.6% is all that they make up of all the hours worked by this group of people. So, and it's still even small for those above the JLC range, 2.6%. Now, if you look at the actual amount of money on average, mean, the mean overtime earnings JLC range per person, per respondent, is six euro. Not excessive by anybody's standards. Above the JLC range is 26 euro. And the shift allowances is even more. And what we find later is that, ironically, JLC workers say that they work more shift work and they get less money for it. They get one euro on average for the shift allowance, and bonuses the same. So what this table shows is, is that, there, on average anyway, there's very little overtime hours worked, 
and it means there's very little money goes to JLC workers from overtime or from shift allowances. And uh, this table is scale gives you a little more detail. And it, it moves a little bit beyond the average because it shows you, if we look at the overtime hours weekly, which is the first part of the table, if you can see it, is it, is it a bit too, too small? You can see that the overtime hours weekly, you can see that at the JLC range, 86% of all respondents in this group, of the 168,000, 86% don't work any overtime. And 14% do. And when you break the 14% down, 5% up to two hours, and another 5% up to five hours. So 10% has up to 10 hours over time. When we look at these figures, what does it tell us about the overtime? And by the way, overtime hours include Sunday premium hours because all overtime hours are included. It tells us that it doesn't mean anything to the vast majority of people in JLCs don't work any overtime. Why don't they work any overtime? Because they don't work enough hours to even get up to overtime. And it's not classed as overtime. So there's only 14% of these people work any overtime, and 10% work up to five hours per week, which I don't think can be considered excessive. So it's quite small. And if you look at the overtime earnings as well, same idea. Obviously, 86% don't get any money from overtime, and 4% to get up to 20 euro. It's very small. The amount of money involved, again, if you look at the figures here, tell us that when we leave the averages behind, it's a tiny number of work over time, and they don't particularly get a lot of money per week from that. <coughs> Shift allowances are the same. 97% uh, of people who work in the JLC range don't get any shift allowance whatsoever. Now, this becomes surprising when we, because it's a question where the employers, if this is the employer filled in information, the employer supplies all of these rates, whether people, how much they get for shift allowance, etc. But there's a question in the employee survey which says, do you work shift work? And as we go to see, a great proportion say they do work shift work. So I'll get out to that question now. That's it there. Now, if you look at this particular table, okay. You can see here. Except that quite a number of the people on the JLC range, 94% uh, of those who are working shift work and not receiving, receiving an allowance, are uh, according to this, 94% uh, of, the, uh, of the number. I'm not, uh, sorry, I'm not actually. Okay, you can see that I, even I, every time I look at this table, I get confused. And the reason being that it's so counterintuitive. There's 94% of those on the JLC range who say that their working shift work don't get an allowance. Only 6% get an allowance. Mm -hmm. That's how you read that. Those above the range, 31% of those who work shift, or say they work shift, get an allowance. But even there, 69% don't get a shift allowance. So what that, that, that indicates is that there's a huge number of people, even throughout all employees, who work shift work and don't get any allowance. So it's quite a substantial uh, 
Now, what this means is, in terms of JLCs, in terms of how people work, what it means is that, obviously, the notion of a seven-day week, the notion of Sunday or Saturday, doesn't exist. That's what these figures show us. Huge proportion of people who tick the box that they work shift allowances don't get a shift allowance. So it's the end of the typical working day for most people. Okay, so the, the, the conclusion is that the evidence from the National Employment <coughs> Survey, which is a comprehensive survey, doesn't support the arguments that uh, extra payments to workers covered by JLCs represent a huge cost to employers. It doesn't represent a huge cost. There's no evidence whatsoever. That doesn't mean that there might be one or two or certain employers who actually do pay a lot on Sunday premiums, but they're few and far between. On average, as we've seen, most workers covered by JLC rates do not have any overtime or any Sunday premiums. They're confined to a small proportion of workers. Uh, so the removal of this floor of conditions is likely to promote firms with lower labour costs and disadvantaged firms who are with better payers. So it's a, it's, a, it's a sort of dry race to the bottom. And these re recent events show that unregulated capitalism is its own worst enemy. So you drive down productivity, it's not good for the sector, you have poor employers, and you drive out good employers, you drive out investment. So essentially, in the end, it does not advantage even the sector itself, even the employers themselves. And many of the employers, so at least some of the employers, are aware of this. In the security industry, when there's a, uh, a prospect that the JLCs would be deemed to be illegal, that when the constitutional challenge would be brought, the employers in the security industry banded together <coughs> and they also they nego negotiated with the trade unions and their intention was to set up an alternative to the JLC among both the trade unions and the employers. Why would they do that? We're back to efficiency wages. Security industry is probably important to have employees who are dependable, who are going to be uh, you know, motivated and they're possibly looking after the expense of equipment and other kinds of conditions. And it's not in the interest of employers to drive down the wages to such a low level, not to pay over time. And so in that sense, there was this move in the security industry to, to uh, develop an alternative. Now, the contract cleaning, it's also happening. These employment regulation agreements, there's a drive to try and bring the employers and the unions in the contract cleaning industry together create a set of conditions. So they're, they're moving towards the idea of controlling the industry to some extent. So there are alternatives so, to this particular uh, drive to the 